Um, so thank you so much for coming to our fourth and final panel of Grants Week 2014. Uh, it's been an incredible week, and uh, first of all, a really big thank you to HowlRound, who's watching this on live stream right now up in Boston. Uh, they've been a great collaborator on this project, and we're just happy to get these issues out and being discussed. A big part of that is all of you here and all of you watching right now. Out of curiosity, could you raise your hand if you've been to all the panels the whole week? Yeah. Whoa. How about three of the panels? Wow. Two of the panels? Rock on, guys. This is great. <laughs> um, today is also a really exciting time for us because we moved into this space on November 4th. So this is our first sort of industry open event. Um, and going along with that, we have a couple of other events going on. In August, we are having our 39th annual Off-Off-Broadway Short Play Festival. Woo! If you're not aware of what OOB, as we call it, is, uh, it's a really exciting festival. It's from August 5th through the 10th. We got how many submissions this year? Oh, almost 1,400. Almost 1,400, and narrowed it down to just 30 short plays. Uh, a lot of time was taken. They are presented during the week, and then they move on gradually to a finalist round on Saturday. So I encourage all of you to come. It's a great time to support the arts and young, emer well, not young, but emerging playwrights. Um, and it's a fun time, so check it out. Also, after today, after the panel, we'd like to invite all of you to stay for a little reception in the back. You can check out the rest of our offices. Yes. <laughs> um, and one other thing, cell phones. Please silence them, but feel free to use them. I will be live tweeting from right here. Some of our panelists might be live tweeting. Uh, and it's been a really fun component of the week to have all of that going on. So without further ado, I will hand it over to our panel and our wonderful moderator, writer and theater director, Isaac Butler. Hello, uh, hello everyone uh, here today and people of the internet. Go ahead, come on, go ahead and go ahead. Come on, come on. These are our lovely panelists who I'll introduce in just one second. Stephen Chakelson is a, a general manager, producer, and professor at Columbia University School of the Arts. Uh, Bruce Lazarus, Here. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Bruce Lazarus <laughs> is the executive director of Samuel French. Uh, Brad Lawrence is the director of licensing for Samuel French. Laura Penn is the executive director of the Stage Directors and Choreographers Society. And Tori Keenan Zelt is a playwright, screenwriter, and VP of Ops at Kanji. So please welcome our distinguished <laughs> So uh, today, the, the big topic of the day is piracy, piracy in the digital age. And so uh, since you work firmly in the digital age, Tori, and since maybe not everyone here is familiar with Kanji, I thought I would give you a chance to talk about the company, and also if you could um, uh, kick us off by talking a little bit about like how you define theatrical piracy or how you think about it as, a, as even a term. Sure. Um, hi. Uh, Kanji is a tech startup. Um, it's, it's designed to be a community for um, dramatic writers, playwrights and screenwriters, and people who work with them as collaborative artists or in another way, like agents, producers, directors. Um, and publishers. Uh, it started out as a tool for sharing scripts, um, for making scripts available to that community, um, recognizing that writers also need to be able to control their work and to manage its sharing. Um, so it's a, it's a platform on which writers can share scripts securely. They're searchable as 10-page previews, um, and then writers manage permission to view a full script. So if I want to read your script, I request your permission, you grant it to me, um, and then it's shared to my personal bookshelf, and I can read it, and if you, up to, if you upload a new script, I have the new script. Um, and there, there are professional connections and all kinds of things that are built out from that, but it started as that tool, um, and we've developed a community around that. Um, I'm sorry, what was the question? Uh, just, uh, so, <laughs> you, I mean, so obviously if you're controlling, you know, if I need your permission to view the script, right? So we're, what is piracy? What is piracy? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Right, well, from a writer's perspective, I define it as any unauthorized use of my writing, um, of my script. Um, so that could be a production that um, changes an element that I've put into the script. It could be a production that I'm unaware of and have not given permission for either through um, my publisher or on my own terms. Um, 
Yeah, I'm feeling kind of let's talk about. Yeah, that. great, yeah. great. Okay, so those are those are two definitions, right? Uh, unauthorized changes to a script and an unauthorized production of the script, right? So how else are uh, uh, do do and anyone feel free to jump in on this? How how else are we thinking about this this term? I'll, I'll jump, yeah, I'll jump in. So um, in regards to uh, plays, authors' rights. There's a few different things, and, and I just want to also address it from the digital age, since that's our, our, our topic today. Um, you know, this piracy as in uh, reprinting or putting online someone's script. Mm -hmm. Unauthorized, um, the, the, uh, the playwright isn't getting paid for it, maybe the playwright doesn't even want it up. Uh, it's on uh, digital platforms. We work very hard to uh, take those things down. Um, in fact, we have a little, we worked at what was the number of how many we took down in the last 10 days or so? It was over 470. In 10 oh, days? Yeah. Wow. And then, so that's on the list. <laughs> someone on their, their blog being like, hey, I have a PDF of pterodactyls or whatever. Whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mrs. So Rexon's third grade class doing our town. Right, so we go on and we, 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 so we, we scour the, the web for it. Um, and uh, so that's as far as uh, scripts go. Um, we also, and, and part of the, the, the digital age is it makes it easy for us to find those things because whether it's a Google search or we have some secret web crawlers, we <laughs> have to find those things. Um, and then also from a, a, a production standpoint, it's uh, unauthorized productions. We have lots of pirated productions out there where people don't, uh, don't tell us about it and just go ahead and produce it. Um, and it's insidious, you know, if, if uh, Again, we, we find them, we, we send cease to the system, we shut them down. I actually heard a funny story, well, it's not so funny, really, but someone, not our property, someone was doing um, uh, Reasons to be Pretty, mm -hmm. and they changed the title of the play to yeah. Ugly People. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't, didn't credit the author. Who's the author in the Reasons to be Pretty? They didn't credit the author. And how do you find that? <laughs> someone ratted it out, and, and, and so it was discovered. But, um, uh, so there's, there's pirated productions, but you know, piracy goes a little farther and deeper than that. Um, if someone is changing the work of an artist, you know, they're, they're not only pirating their uh, economic, financial interest in it, but they're, they're pirating their you know, emotional um, well-being, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, we had a situation recently where uh, one of our artists went to see a uh, a musical that she spent years writing, only to find out that the director had rearranged the songs and right. changed the things. And she's sitting there for two hours being like, you know, feeling violated by it. So this uh, emotional capital that's also being pirated. Um, anyway, that, that's some of it. Interesting. Any, any other thoughts on just a baseline sort of how we're defining this term? Yeah, I think, um, I think everything Bruce is talking about is absolutely correct. I would even, maybe for purposes of this discussion today, even open up the idea of piracy and make it a, a little more broad. You know, the unauthorized use of anything, that, any material protected by copyright. Um, because it's important that, uh, well, it's, we have to protect the playwrights, the author's work. Um, playwrights, directors, they also have to be aware of the potential infringement that, that they could wind up, the type, types of situations they could be in. The internet has made material available you know, instantaneously. So whether that's taking copyrighted work and you know, pieces of, of existing written material and incorporating them in some way into mm -hmm. a play, uh, taking images and using them as part of a stage design, uh, using music to set the mood of a show, and you know, you find this great piece online, and you say, okay, well, let me put that as underscoring in this scene. So it's important, I think, that um, you know, overall, that as artists, we're all, everybody is respecting each other. Whether it's a piece that, that was create a visual piece, um, a music piece, a theater piece, and, um, and everybody needs to be educated so that everyone's rights are protected. I, I would just say, I mean, it's theft, and I agree with everything that's been said. Piracy is theft of someone else's property, um, uh, and the, the unlawful use of that. One of the things that we spend a lot of time um, trying to wrap our heads around uh, is the unlawful capture of performance and distribution or exploitation. 
So hours. what do you mean by what do you mean by exploitation? Is that like a I'm directing a production of it and I see that a film of a production could, of it? That means you could you could and I did my own little oh let me check because I haven't been on this site in a while today and you know for twenty three ninety nine you can see Beautiful the musical right now. Go ahead. Now it may not be a very good production. Um, because it's from somebody's cell phone, or actually they do shoulder cameras and capture, but you can go online right now and pay for, which means someone's being paid, and it is not the artist's. Um, and you can watch, beautiful, you can watch, you can watch anything you want. You know, some shows are only fourteen ninety nine if they've been around for a while. So, <laughs> so um, people are sort of bootlegging shows in the kind of like a '80s movie theater piracy kind of. They are. You know, they like, are. like in the Seinfeld episode with. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Right, okay. And the question, the question really is now. I think many of us understand that the thirteen year old girl, or I can say twelve year old girl, my daughter, watching a YouTube clip in her bedroom that actually avoids the web crawlers because they speed it up a microsecond. Right. Because I found her watching Shrek. And my teenage son said, oh yeah, mom, it's fine. They speed it up. So she, you couldn't tell it was speeded up, but it avoids the web huh. crawlers mm. because the rhythm of the music is just that much more different. Huh. So there's the unlawful capture and distribution, but the more and more things are captured lawfully, HD captures, there runs the risk of those being distributed then and exploited unlawfully nationally and internationally. So th this is, and this is a place where we're all in this together because there's real money in them there hills and it's not going mm. to our artists. Interesting, interesting. And I wonder, you know, I wonder based on this, because obviously, like, the other thing that happens on YouTube, which I guess is probably technically a violation of copyright, is, like, someone's daughter is in a high school production of David Ives' Fall in the Timing, and they have, like, sure thing, and they put it on YouTube so they can share it with her uncle, or, you know, or whatever. And that's technically a violation of copyright, but we would probably say that's not, the, that's not as big a problem as bootlegging beautiful and selling it for $20. So, so we, what, we actually take those down. No, I, no, yeah, I'm saying yeah, you no, take them down, but I'm just, I'm wondering sort of like, <laughs> What are, from your perspective, sort of the biggest problems in, in, in this world of piracy? Well, I, I would like to add, though, about YouTube. Even though there may not be money generated from that, it could be such a horrible production that's out there that that could really influence and impact others wanting to do the show. Right. And if that's what they see, then they're like, I'm not bothering with ever producing that show again. Mm -hmm. So there, there is that impact as well. Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 of course. I'm not saying it's... I think there's, yeah. a, there's yeah. a difference between sort of innocent, you know, I'm capturing my daughter's high school performance, and, you know, sort of malicious, whether it's charging money for it or out and out, you know, a professional company changing someone's work. Right, right. Uh, well, you know, there's other kinds of piracy, too. We call it more of uh, compliance or enforcement, where people will cheat on their license. You know, they'll say that they're doing uh, two performances and they're doing 20 performances. Mm -hmm. and they'll say they're doing it in a you know, a hundred seat theater and it's a thousand seat theater. Mm -hmm. Where they say they're charging ten dollars a ticket and it's fifty dollars a ticket. And does that sort of stuff happen very often? Uh, it happens. Um, I did the number. I, I gave the numbers to Brad. I don't know how many. It we happens had. frequently. I had a great conversation with the uh, Lori Timpson, our director of licensing compliance, today. Since January. This is just since January, we have issued 30 cease and desist, like we have closed down unlicensed productions. Oh. So one, one thing that we instill here is that when we hire new licensing representatives or licensing specialists, part of their training that is ingrained into them, always have, a, always have an eye on that website that you're, the people you're talking to. Double check everything they, they tell us. We're always constantly looking for everything that's out there is their application actually expressing what is on their website because even though they initially tell us ticket prices are X amount and so many performances and these are the dates, we always have to confirm that because there's always, not always, but frequently there's a discrepancy between that. So we, it, we just are, everybody has on their good cop hat and their bad cop hat right, every right. day. I just, here. Want, I just want to add one other thing. You know, when people, this is my take. I think it's human nature. If someone's taking a song or a movie, oh, they're taking it from a Hollywood studio or a big record company. What a, it's nothing to them. But you know, in the theater, if you're taking it from 
a writer, you know, writers, there are very few playwrights that really can earn a living in the theater, and a lot of them try to. And when you take away that income from them, you're taking away their family's grocery money. You're taking away real money from a family. You know, that we as an agent, we take 10 or 20 percent. They're getting 80 or 90 percent. So you're taking the money away from them. They think even if they're, they're taking it from Samuel French, you know, but they're not. They're taking it away from the author. And, and that's really the, the, mm -hmm. the shame here. Because if authors can't make a living in the theater, then they're not going to write. They're going to be busy making a living, doing something else. Right. And I think there's also something very sad about the fact that um, when people are cheating on their licenses, what we're talking about are people who care enough to be doing theater in the first yes. place. <laughs> and seriously, if you care enough to be doing theater, then care about the artists who helped create it, mm -hmm. and don't cheat on the $50 or whatever it will be. That's right. You know, that was, people go back to them. There was something, it, you, I wrote it down, and I don't have it with me, in your essay that you wrote about uh, teachers uh, teaching the value of art. Right. And that if you don't value artists, then... Right. Yeah. Do you remember what your quote was? Yeah, I was basically saying <laughs> that. What, what I'm saying, and actually this gets to a question I wanted to ask, you know, for our various definitions of piracy, where we're seeing it happen. Because my, my assumption is going into this is that a lot of this is happening in the education world. That a lot of this is happening in colleges or student theater companies or in the amateur sector. And maybe I'm completely wrong about this in terms of unlicensed production, but it happens less frequently in the professional world simply because it's so visible that it's easy to catch it. Yeah. Again, that's my assumption, I could be wrong. So that was why I included that sentence about, hey, I have a feeling a lot of this goes on in the education world. I probably did it when I was in, I probably did a play without paying for it when I was in college, you know, oh, those many years ago. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that we can instill as educators as a value is that, hey, like if you value art, you have to pay the people who make it, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I think it does happen, and I think some of it is that we have not done the education that we need to do. And not only are they unlicensed productions, but they're replications of all of the artists' work. So they're replications of the designer's work, of the choreographer's work, of the, you know, it's everybody's work, of the director's work. So that they're taking the unlawfully captured productions, mm -hmm. and they are unlawfully replicating the script, the everything. So, um, and a lot of it is because some don't know that they can't do that, um, and some because we haven't made it as easy as we need to for them to do that, and then some, I guess, are just mean. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would like to add to that, and what we here try to do at Sam and French is particularly if it's an educational institution, we try to make it an educational experience. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> well, teach a teaching moment. <laughs> so like, if you come so to Stephen, and you're like, Stephen, you know, you really shouldn't have put on, uh, I don't know. Well, hopefully we catch it in advance right. or while it's going on. So instead of beating the heck out of them, we talk to them, we tell them exactly where it went wrong, what they were supposed to have done, how they were supposed to have done it. Usually, not always, but usually the teachers are horrified because you know sometimes teachers are the ones who get the coin flip in it yeah. in the, and in the teacher's lab it. and they're in charge of the play that year and they may not know, oh well here's some scripts left over in the library, let's just do a play. They hmm. may not know that there's actual copyright attached to that. So we try to make it an educational experience, but it does, it, it has to do with education. One of the things we recently <laughs> became aware of like a light bulb went off for us that you know we send out our licenses and it's very clear that you know unauthorized changes uh, you, know, you, you can't make certain changes whether it's to the the order of the show or the placing of the intermission or changing the characters or the gender of the characters you know playwrights have certain uh, restrictions others are, are free with it and the like but it occurred to us that the director of the play may not see that license. There's some administrator who's signing off on that license. And so that teacher, or even in a professional situation, they didn't see that. Now we assume they know that. But so now, uh, and I've been talking with Laura about this, we're in conversation about it. Uh, we would like to actually have the director of the play you know, acknowledge that they know that they're not allowed to make unauthorized mm -hmm. changes. Mm, interesting. And I imagine like a, a, an unauthorized change to a show is a lot harder to catch than an unauthorized production because the Google alert goes off that 
reasons to be pretty is happening. You're like, hey, we didn't. Like well, you know, who was, we were talking recently. With, what was it? The top someone commented, or, or there was a review that said, and and in the top of the second act, there's no intermission in this play. <laughs> <laughs> or this new 90-minute version. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, and so, uh, you know, Stephen, from a from I guess either an educator perspective, you know, from, from an educator's perspective, because you've taught for a long time at, at Columbia in that management program. I mean, do you guys, what what conversations do you have around this stuff? I, I just you know speak yeah. on that program. Is there is there ethics component to graduating from there? Is there you know I know you teach classes on the law and the arts, and so well, I, you know, in terms of the theater management and producing program, which I run. Um, we spend a lot of time dealing with rights issues. Uh, you know, it's coming out of their ears by the end of the first year. It's we, you know, really having dealt with issues of intellectual property, small rights, grand rights, licensing work, assignment, all different aspects of it um, for the entire first year of the program. Um, I think it's sort of a given. You're, if it's a management and producing program, you're dealing with the business, you're dealing with the law. It's kind of it's natural that you're going to be uh, confronting those issues, dealing with that kind of curriculum. Uh, the problem is the is the you know an acting program, a directing program, even a playwriting program, and most of the time you don't have a lot of exposure to the business of the business. Mm -hmm. Right, you're dealing with the art of the business, but you're not dealing with the business. Um, and you know if you're um, maybe you have just the basics of getting an agent or what a contract is, that type of thing. But you're not really getting into what I think are really important, the important issues of intellectual property, which are important or crucial for all artists to be aware of. Um, you know, even at Columbia, there's been very little that's really structured in the graduate program as far as introducing the artists mm -hmm. to these topics. Uh, we, in the past, have dealt with them pretty much on a one-off basis. When a director is, has said, okay, this is what I want to do as my second year project, this is what I want to do as my thesis production, then they go through a, a process with their producer or manager who's a student and with the departmental staff of how to acquire the rights. Mm -hmm. um, and so they learn by doing. Right? Mm -hmm. it's, they're sort of mentored in that process. And is that because it tends to be you know, an MFA and master's program, right? It's like, well, this is the art, and you're here to nurture your art for a couple of years, and you're probably spending tens of thousands of dollars to do so, mm -hmm. and so we're not going to bother with the real world stuff. It's like, here's where you become an artist, <laughs> well, right? And then uh, even though there's all these practical realities that are so important to that life. I think the artists want to teach the art, and who can really blame them? They right. don't want to bother with the others, with, with the business side, um, with those rules. Um, but because you know you have a lot of really creative people out there who are students who are flexing their creative muscles and, and working in school, um, you know they uh, they're doing their thesis production. They want to make it the best production they've ever done. They're dreaming big, uh, and they want to adapt. They want to change language. They want to change characters from male to female. They want to experiment in many different ways, and um, you know they're. Because they're being mentored through that process, um, we're able to either advise them or their their faculty able to advise them. And sometimes we will actually go to a particular licensing company or an agent from whom we've gotten the rights and say, "Here's a request. Mm -hmm. Can we do this?" Mm -hmm. So you know, because we're Columbia, because we're high profile, we take these issues really seriously. Um, something that we've actually discussed fairly recently um, is. A um, kind of a master class for all the first year MFA students who come in to really introduce them to these basic concepts in the same way that we're introducing them to okay here's how you produce a show in this particular theater or here's how you deal with tech in this particular theater let's also talk about here's how you deal with rights if you want to do a project because there's so much you know when you get into when you get into uh, making theater in an educational setting there's also a lot of that goes in, into it as far as uh, what people consider to be fair use, what they think they should be allowed to get away with, not when they're working extracurricularly, but here, I'm paying so much money and spending all this time to become a theater artist, there's amount, a certain amount of fair use, and people throw that terminology around, and I should just be entitled as part of my education to do this. Um, and especially if I'm doing it and I'm, uh, and I'm not charging admission, 
um, there are a lot of thorny questions that come up. And I think it's really important for us um, to sort of start from the very beginning and set the ground rules. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And, and I was just going to say, we would happy to be happy to come and be guest lecturers at one of those classes. We <laughs> <laughs> make things happen. You know, careful what you wish what's for. Interesting, <laughs> what's interesting is I did actually, and I know there's several programs at Columbia, so forgive me if I confuse them, um, but I did go and speak with uh, Ann Bogart's yep. class mm -hmm. this year, which was fantastic, and I actually you know, proposed to her that possibly um, Ralph Savish and I would be an interesting duo um, at some point to come in and talk with the directors and writers. R Ralph Savage um, of the Dramatist Guild. Of the Dramatist Guild. Oh, yes. I'm, I just <laughs> assumed. We're getting very, a lot of so nice. I know. I know. <laughs> 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 I take it back. I'll call it tomorrow. Um, but I, what, what's interesting is I think we have, as the organization that represents professional directors and choreographers, I think probably um, some of what has happened, particularly with the proliferation of professional training programs, and I think the reliance that we have in the field on those programs to train. Um, so you get trained and then you're a professional. And I think there's, there, there's assumptions made on both sides. Um, I, I have to just sort of you know, respond to some of this by, of course, saying that there, there is no support whatsoever from SDC as an organization for the unlawful um, uh, you know, changing, adapting, manipulation of uh, an author's property. I mean, that's just wrong. You can't do it. Um, so how do we um, engage in that? And what is the education of our members, given that I think we probably on some level just, it's like, well, of course you can't do that. I mean, it's shocking. Of course you can't do that. So how did, how did, where did we get confused? and what happens in the training programs, what happens in the professional arena, and how can we collaborate to strengthen mm -hmm. um, the education. Uh, so. um, Tori, I was wondering, you know, for you, I mean, have you, because you're our playwright on the panel, one of the things, have you had experience of this, of knowing of a production that changed your work, or that did your work without you telling it, telling, or giving permission, or, I mean, have you actually, no, I haven't had it personally. I have had people contact me about a script that is published and ask if they can do the production without paying the licensing fee right. because it's a, a fundraiser or mm -hmm. something like that. Um, and you know, I, I want people to be doing my work, so I, my my gut says sure. But I I think that I as a writer need to be more um, careful about if I'm going to make a decision to share my work in that way recognizing that that's what I'm doing, that I'm actually subsidizing the production in some way. Um, and I think when we talk about value and ascribing value to scripts, especially in an educational setting, it's sort of funny territory because um, my goal as an early career writer, as an MFA student, was to get my scripts good enough that people want them and they want to pay money for them. But there's so much work that goes into um, developing a plan. I mean, it takes years and years, right? Um, so it already has value before I am making a living as a playwright, and how can I leverage it and recognize that that's happening? Mm -hmm. um, and that's not been part of the conversation, at least in my case. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Are you currently? Are you currently in a No, I am about, about a year. Out. Oh, oh, great. Cool. Cool. Um, I guess, and this is sort of a question for anyone who wants to leap in and take it. I mean. Obviously, uh, if you're published by Sam French, you have a certain structure behind you that represents you, that helps you know deal with this issue, that sends those those cease and desist letters, um, you know, except, or if you have an agent, they have a, your management team. You know, you have a team behind you. But I, I'm sure for plenty of people watching this, and or who will watch it or following it on Twitter, they, they don't have a team. You know, they're they're a, they're a younger or earlier career playwright, and they've uh, you know they a Google alert for their name comes out, and they find out in Sheboygan someone is doing a, a play of their you know who knows maybe in New York. And uh, um, uh, what just to speak to that experience for a little bit, sort of like what structures are in place that that that, that artist can take advantage of that they can. I mean, do you, do you have to hire a lawyer? Do you have to like, you know, so what, you know, what, what do you do in that instance? Um, and anyone who wants to jump in on that. Uh, not, not to uh, uh, yeah, jump in. You know, number one, you can call the Dramatist Guild. Yeah. I'm sure they're happy to, to help whether you're a member or not, although it's not too expensive to become a member of the Dramatist Guild. 
But you know, uh, you can be your own lawyer. You don't need a lawyer to send a cease and desist letter. I'm sure you can find the cease and desist letter on the internet. Probably um, <laughs> 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 copyright. Sorry, it's not. It's interesting that because, you know, uh, I, I actually had... Um, and you'll get a cease and desist. <laughs> <laughs> I actually saw uh, a contract that came in and the attorney had copyrighted his contract. I never saw that before. <laughs> um, because lawyers traditionally cut and paste. And, uh, yeah. So, um, so I think you, can, you know, I think it's really about valuing your work. Just like you know, they asked you to do it for free. Um, what when you said it, what popped in my mind was, I would have said, you know what, pay me a hundred dollars and I'll do make a donation of a hundred dollars. But at least there's value in your work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think if we don't value the work, then it has less value. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I think people can, can take care of themselves. Um, there's, there's volunteer lawyers for the arts. There's all kinds right, of right. resources. Right. Um, interesting. And I guess, you know, to, to circle back to the, uh, the internet question, right, because we're, 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 this is piracy in the digital age, to get to the second half. Um, you know, Laura, what, uh, what efforts, so, I mean, you were talking about, you know, people are bootlegging productions of plays, and they're selling their you know, again, Kramer with the video camera style <laughs> uh, uh, version of uh, Beautiful online, right? Uh, and, and what is the SDC, SDC doing around this, this sort of stuff? Well, first of all, I think that the, the solution to that is ultimately going to rest in collaboration with a group of mm -hmm. artists and certainly, and, you know, unions and guilds. We spend a fair amount of time talking about this at COBA, which is the Coalition of Broadway Unions and Guilds, as much of this, although not exclusively, but much of it is Broadway commercial work that is, um, has the higher value. Um, so it's a, it's a collaborative effort, I think, that's going to sort of help us find our way. Um, but I think what we're specifically trying to do is create relationships and try to find the model that works for the lawful capture and the lawful distribution and make that, it's not unlike, you know, frankly, iTunes, right? Mm -hmm. It's not unlike what the music industry did. We've got to find a way to actually allow our product and our work, we, we can't deny that, I mean, we. With, with the advent of HD captures and you know technology, you can actually capture live theater in a way now that's quite dynamic and pretty fabulous. And I'll pay 20 bucks to go see Phaedra, you know, from <laughs> NT Live, because it's really great. So it doesn't replace the live experience, but we, we can't deny that this is happening and is going to happen more and more. So how do we figure out how to embrace it make it possible, make sure the artists are compensated up front, and that there's some sort of back end. So we're working with producers and our collaborators to try to figure out how to do that. So, so just part of what you're saying then is that one of the ways to control piracy is to, to find a way to distribute the product in a way that people can get their hands on it at a, let's say, a reasonable price, however we're defining that, and that cuts out a certain amount of the people who are turning to, you know, I mean, that's one of the things that they show, one of the things that iTunes did, if I remember correctly, exactly. is it took a chunk of the pirating market because there was a cheaper and more convenient way to get music. And there was legal. a study done in London, I'm sorry, there no, was a study done in London around the NT Live about, you know, does it actually, are you, um, you know, hijacking theater go? Is it going to, you know, cannibalize, cannibalize your theater goers? And, and it's not. The people that are going to go see it in the movie theater are either the people who are going to see it in the theater as well, because they like that dynamic, or they're never going to see it in the theater. So it's just more um, people. So I don't think cannibalization is a problem. I think that study even showed that people who had never been to the National Theater reported they were more likely to go in when the they future. were visiting London because they had seen NNT Live. Yeah. Um, so I think, it, I think it's a room. May I ask her a follow-up question? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I get her opinion? <laughs> yeah. So I, mean, I was just curious, do you feel like then the live stage experience right now, uh, live stage theater, we're behind in all of this? Yes. I think we, I, I think sometimes we feel a little precious mm -hmm. about ourselves and our um. work. Um, and I think, uh, I, think we, I think we are behind because we just weren't going to go there. Right, because mm -hmm. the live theater experience is live. 
And what happened is sort of technology and a few smart entrepreneurs and then a lot of kids and a lot of young people and a lot of it figured out, okay, well, we're doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. So I do think we thought it'll never happen. And I, I think we're, we're, I think we were wrong. Mm -hmm. And that there's no money in it. You know, there's no money in it, right? There's no money in it. But if you had told me 10 years ago I was going to pay 200 bucks a month to watch TV, <laughs> right? right? You know? But somebody's paying $20 for that bootlegged beautiful. Well, they so are. So there is but somebody that's because will pay money for They will pay money for it, exactly. I mean, but I think 10 so, years ago yeah. it would have been, forget You know, nobody's going to pay to see a Broadway show on their television. Sure they are. They're watching them on their Kindle. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Interesting. Interesting. We, we had a question. Uh, I don't know if this is someone from the audience or from Twitter. I just asked them. Um, asking about the just sort of the, the general issue of the publication, not the production of scripts, but the publication of scripts without permission online, which of course I guess makes it easier to produce them without permission because then you can just, you know, you search that playwright and you find them. And, and obviously this is something that was a big concern for Kanji, because you can only read a ten-page excerpt, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. Is the you know from from that perspective? Yeah, that's a slightly different question because it sounds like that's about other people publishing right. a script on behalf of a writer. Um, Kanji is really trying to solve the problem of how do you make your work more available and discoverable while and still protecting it, while still protecting it and managing it. Um, yeah, but the thinking behind the 10-page preview was that that's sort of a standard with lit managers, right? You do get a 10-page preview, you evaluate the script, and then you decide if you want to read more often. Um, so that's enough to at least get a feel and give people a taste. And then as the writer, you want to manage um, access to the full piece because that has real value. Um, the scripts are not downloadable from Kanji, and they're not printable, although if you're, it's the internet. If you're intrepid, you can do screenshots, but that's just like photocopying a script, right? right. It takes time, and um, yeah, <laughs> so it's... Well, I press Apple too so many times. <laughs> <laughs> you guys will just ask me for it, and we'll give it to you. Right, right, yeah. Um, yeah, so what, what we do with our, you know, when we do a musical, we have rental material. We'll be renting the uh, orchestrations and the like. Um, and when we send out a license, those rental materials are marked with the licensee's name and uh, order number. So, um, I mean, someone could, I guess, white out everything and, you know, scan it and the like, but it makes it very hard for them. So when we find materials that's on, that, that is um, uh, pirated, we know where the source is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You're right, because right, their name is just right there. Right. I promise it wasn't. Uh, yeah. Really? Yeah. Actually, I wanted to challenge Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I remember having to erase those, right? And whenever you did the show at summer camp, you always had to erase them so that they could go in and that's that you, uh, that you wouldn't get. What, what camp was that? <laughs> Rock, can you go for camp? So, the, uh, the, uh, yeah. Um, so, so, you know, to, to speak more to this digital age question, do you guys feel just in general, I mean, obviously you've said that the internet in some ways makes it much easier to track when the piracy is occurring, but it also creates some new mechanisms via which it, it, it occurs, right? So, you know, now that we're in web 4.0 or whatever era of the web we're in, um, do you think that we're doing a, a better job of controlling it than we used to? A worse job of controlling it? Is it harder? Is it easier? You know, what, what, and what new strategies, I mean, you know, obviously you've spoken to, to one new strategy, but what, what new strategies, any of you, do you, do you, do you feel we could, we could use to sort of get ahead of the, the digital innovation? I, I think there's actually less of it, but I think we find it more. So it feels like there's a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's been going on for a long time and just, you know, we haven't known about it. Uh, so now we see it and now we go after it. I, then, I, 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 I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I agree and I also feel like even if a theater thinks they got caught and they erase it completely from their website, guess what? Somebody's in that cast and they still have it on their Facebook page. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have captured a lot of things that <laughs> on Facebook page as well, so I think it's... I just want to say, we're not really, I mean, as a, as a licensor, we want to protect our authors, but you know, the, the producer's also our customer, so we're not looking to really embarrass them, we're looking to educate them, we're looking to have them do the right thing. You know, at some point, um, actually I, had, I once heard someone say, you know, the customer is always right, 
until they're not your customer anymore. <laughs> a customer who is stealing from us is not our customer anymore. In which case, then you know we're gonna we're gonna do what we have to do. But we want to we listen. We love theater. We want people to be making theater. We want the playwright to make money. We want the, the theater to make money. We want the audience to enjoy the show. So we're facilitators of theater. So we're not looking to um, uh, to squelch them. We just want them to play fair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on the, the, the internet, whether it's made it uh, easier or harder? More, just more visible? I think it's made it easier to replicate full productions. I think we find, um, you know, community theaters, you know, more semi-professional companies probably that are able to literally replicate an entire production. And we work quite closely with the designers to help each other. Like, oh, my set, oh, so you're, you know, to make sure we're um, trying to find those. Whether those are lawfully licensed plays, whether the playwright or the composer or the lyricist um, are part of that or not, we, we don't, we, I guess we assume they're lawfully licensed. <laughs> I mean, we haven't, we haven't put you in that loop. Maybe we should, because we, um, but, but I think it, it has made it easier and some of that, when it comes to preservation and legacy, and you know, some of that will end up being great because don't we all wish we had more of Fosse's work, you know, available um, from a historical perspective, for example. But I think it has made it harder to um, easier to do and harder to keep track of in some ways from that point of view, mm -hmm. which is a little different. <laughs> I would say email for scripts. You know, it makes it so much easier to share and to pass on something that is yeah. very valuable. Um, and so now the challenge is how do we create tools that will, well, at least from my perspective, um, that will yeah. let us share them, but also let us track them and let us um, treat them as the valuable commodities that they are. Interesting. Interesting. I think um, even though it's a little early, I think it might be fun to because people are some people are tweeting some questions and stuff. It might be fun to throw it over the audience. People seem very eager over here. I see these hands, uh, uh, and I don't know anyone's name. So, so you, sir, in the back. Hi. Yes. Um, so I've been like I've been like sort of like shaking in the back here, like not like angrily, but just sort of like excited to like explore something with you guys. I think like a big problem that like the music industry had, the film industry has, is that like. Um, in the 90s, they weren't like they weren't recognizing how quickly technology was moving, and therefore they weren't valuing their audience. We talk a lot about like audience is not valuing art, which is very true. Like we haven't taught art value, but like when we look at the fact that like Broadway plays cost like four hundred dollars, you know, or whatever for a ticket, we are no longer valuing our our consumers. You know, what I mean, you see, look at the like Hollywood you hear me that like probably has a great audience out there, like a bunch of kids in like you know California would love to see that, right? Like, but like they have no access to it, it like. At, at all, so like you know, of course they want to see like recording, like, like your daughter did. Um, so my question is sort of like, how are we looking to um, better democratize like the art, the art form that we are in? Because right now we work in an, an art form that is very much like a, an ivory tower. It makes it very difficult for people to get things in a way that uh, that in a way that is like just not free, but like accessible. Because if you look at like television that started valuing their artists. Um, or valuing their audiences a lot more, and you, you now pay two hundred dollars for TV. They also like, all employ playwrights. You know, so <laughs> exactly. exactly. And, you know, Just saying. So like now, like as TV is looking more like, oh wow, like there, there's like a world for people who want to watch a show like Community. Like you know, like you know, even though like it's not making that much money, they're like they're doing things like this. So how are you guys as theater creators right. and like theater well, if, probably if, what's, what, what's your name? Jeremy. Jeremy, great. So Jeremy's question, because I have to repeat it for the camera. Yes. So Jeremy's question is about you know, sort of the other way of this two-way street, right? It's not only how do we get audiences to value the art, although it, sometimes it's also about theater practitioners valuing the art they're making, but how do we get artists to value the art, but also how do we get the, the, the artists or the, the producers to value the audience? And it sort of gets back to your point, Laura, and I think I, I raised this in the, in the piece that I wrote about, you know, like, how do you democratize it? How do you offer something at a way that people can access it and that is at a price that you know, seems reasonable. I know that's a really vague term, right? But, you know, so, so how do we kind of, is some of this a, a response to the inaccessibility of the work? And if so, what do we do about that? 
Absolutely. I mean, I think it's, as I said, it, it lies in trying to figure out who we partner with and how we create models that work for the lawful capturing and distribution in other ways. How are you going to get a Broadway ticket for a musical below 150 bucks? Is, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's like a huge thing. Um, uh, that, that's, a big, that's a big gnarly um, problem that we have. But there are other ways to get the work out. Yeah, the, pro the problem with the theater is, is that there's, limit, there's a ceiling on capacity. There's only so many seats in the theater, and the theater's got to figure out how much money to charge in order to pay for all of those artists and all of those designers and all of the, uh, the stagehands and whatever, and make a profit for investors. So it, it's, it's built into it. It's not like a movie where there's, uh, if it's a hit, there's an unlimited number of screens you can go to. One thing I will say is that right now we have like over a thousand people, or how many could be watching this on Howlround right now, you know, and they're engaging with us via Twitter. So like, we can do that in this space. Why couldn't we do that on like, you know, big, like a Spotify of theater? Or like, <laughs> I think that's a great idea. That. It's a great idea. I've got that to live. That's I think NT, that's yeah. yeah. You can subscribe yeah. to NT Live yeah. or the digital theater, the other one they have in. Yeah. There, there is also a, and, and if anyone in the audience knows about this better than I do, please feel free to speak speak to this. There is also, oddly, on the other end of the spectrum, with like uh, more underground and experimental work, there is a pay-per-view internet service, like Young Jean Lee's. On the boards. Yeah. 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 On the boards. On yeah. the boards that started that in Seattle, and yeah. they do, uh, you know, lanes. Does anyone here actually yeah. use on the boards? Is it, do, do you want to? <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. But I, I also would like to add, there is New York City theater, but then there's a thriving theatrical world beyond west of the Hudson River. <laughs> so there is a lot of theater going on out there for not a lot of money, and a lot of theaters every week have pay what you can, and that's both, for, both professional and amateur. So it's easy for us to be here in our insular situation Think about how much tickets cost here, but there is a thriving, vital community west of the Hudson River too, as well. So I, I think it is, and your work is getting, and work is getting done out there. I think it's inevitable that Broadway is ultimately going to embrace the, the digital distribution of, of the work that we create. It's going to take time. It's you know we talk about the education of students. There's a big educational process as well for the people producing and directing and writing work for for Broadway and for you know major commercial and not-for-profit theater. Uh, there's so many issues and, and so many different, I um, shouldn't say factions, but so many different groups and th their respective concerns that need to be heard, need to be dealt with. Um, from, you know, from the point of view of it's gonna cannibalize my audience, it's gonna potentially cannibalize my licensing down the road. Um, I'm sure it, there's all sorts of union stuff that needs um, to be there's, negotiated. There's huge costs and we need to make it much more economically viable to be able to capture and then have everybody share in, um, participate in profits down the line, participate in success. Um, there's the issue of, well, what if we capture it and it's not quite exactly the way we wanted it? Or what if it, we capture it and it looks like that old-fashioned, you know, great performances broadcast of three cameras <laughs> and sort of standing there and locked in this little television frame, which I agree, you know, we've gotten so much better about how we capture, how we can capture a live experience. So, little by little, uh, I think we, we will get there, it's inevitable. Mm -hmm. I had a crazy capture conversation with somebody that just goes to show how the, the the, you know, the producers are really part of this and have to understand the artist's uh, right to benefit from this because this has to do with a, a very popular show that was captured and the plans for a kind of cinecast, NT Live, although not NT Live, this was several years ago, and trying to figure out what the front end, back end, all the billing, all the stuff you have to figure out when you do this. And because uh, commercial Broadway shows can now be ca captured in their entirety for promotion, there was a moment where this um, person I was talking to actually said, well, you know, we could just say this is promotional to um, uh, advocate or promote the amateur licensing of this. So we're <laughs> capturing the Broadway show, we're screening it on hundreds of screens across the country and selling lots of tickets, but we're gonna call it promotional because we really wanna do this to push the amateur rights. <laughs> now, they, you know, I was like, oh, you got, it's like, well, I'm just saying we could say it. <laughs> yeah, but you're not going to say it, because that's absurd. <laughs> you know, so yes, the unions have.
have to work with producers, but frankly, producers have to understand that. But that just that's how far yeah. like a producer would go to try to maybe not pay an artist. Right, right, right. That's really Unbelievable. Wow. We had a question over here. I want to make sure. Yeah, I actually been waiting to ask this question all week. It's the only question I've asked all week. But, uh, so I'll ask the question. I'll add a few synonyms as a backup. Uh, the question is: Does theater belong in the digital medium? The reason why I ask is because music, books, have all moved into the digital space and have been very much well adopted. Uh, but as a response, we're now in a time where people are starting to move more back to analog. So you can buy, I personally click vinyl records. Oops. You can buy cassette tapes of current bands who release their new albums on cassette. Uh, books, small letterpress, uh, <laughs> indie presses have started releasing physical books that are, uh, you know, that you might want to put on a shelf. Theater itself is an analog experience, and we haven't quite figured it out yet in a way like iTunes that is spot on or Spotify. Uh, so are we just trying to force the round peg into the square hole? Right, and, and what's your name? Ryan. Ryan, okay, so Ryan has a, a question essentially about, you know, obviously like part of theater's essential appeal is its liveness, right? It's mm -hmm. a, you know, that's what makes it immediate. And so uh, should we even be thinking about, well, how do we force this live thing into this? replicable medium, and uh, uh, what what happens to theater when it is broadcast on the screen instead of us, us appearing? Well, in, in I person? think that's a really great question, and what what occurs to me is is that, you know, a movie or a, or a record is meant to be broadcast, uh, television shows, meant to be broadcast and live in some sort of recorded form. And the, the uh, way we replicate the theater is by having groups do it live all across the country, professional and amateur groups performing the show. That is the replica of theater. And it is an analog uh, uh, medium. And, 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 what, and, and, and the stock and amateur licensing of it is the replica. Right. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I sort of feel like there's also been a change in our sort of understanding of what a, a regional production even even is, and I'm thinking about you know if, we, if you buy a, a a production script of I don't know Streetcar, uh, a, a Elliot Kazan's production is detailed in there very carefully from small stage directions to the to the set and everything like that, and there there was a way in which you're speaking in dialogue with or maybe even replicating to some extent what that production looked like, and that that script kind of enables you to do that. And we don't think that way anymore. We're not thinking like Oh well, this production in you know wherever I'm like from D.C. So I'll say this production in Washington D.C. is is kind of like the one that you could have seen in New York. We're saying no, no. If you do that in D.C., it has to be its own independent thing with its own independent ideas, etc. I mean, I feel like part 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 of this is that there's a cultural shift there, right? I mean, maybe it's not formal, well, but it's uh, I think it just comes with the territory. But you know, it's one of the nice things. One of the things I really like about what we do at Samuel French is that, you know, the, I, I equate it with like the gaming industry. We have all of these kids who are virtuoso gamers. And I said to my son once, would you rather, play, would you rather watch the movie or would you rather play the game on the movie? He said, I'd rather play the game. And I said, why? It wasn't his exact words, but basically what he said was, when I play the game, I am the hero. When I watch the movie, I'm watching the hero. And the nice thing about, um, about theater and about doing it in the stock and amateur world is that there's all of these people who want to participate. And they get to be the hero. They get to play, play the parts. And so, th therefore, I think, you know, theater has that, that life in it that, is, that transcends the other media. I would also say when we're talking about the relationship between stage and screen experiences, that has already happened in our culture, right? Because TV came out of theater and early TV was basically um, captured <laughs> by productions. Mm -hmm. And it's evolved and it's become more filmic and now film language is shaped by the perspective of the camera. And so similarly, you kind of have to be one character as you're watching a movie and on stage you're experiencing it as yourself. And, um, and so if we're capturing a stage production, that is inherently different from making a movie of the stage production. Um, I personally am really glad that we have 
captured some wonderful productions, like the original Into the Woods, you know, growing up. Maybe. You watch it on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do that. I don't think that it's, it's either or necessarily. Interesting. Interesting. Yes? One, <clears throat> one comment I'd like to make about, we're noticing now the um, live filming of Sound of Music last year, and now they're doing Peter Pan, uh, which I'm very excited about, I must say. Um, that's different than watching the movie of it. And the kids took to it. I'm the head of the drama department at LaGuardia, and all the kids watch Sound of Music. And I swear to God, none of them, if I've held up Julie Andrews on the cover of Sound of Music, they're out the door. But the fact that it was live, and people could have, like, messed up. <laughs> I said, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> about Christopher Walken playing Captain Hook. They can't wait to see how he's going to do it. Um, so that's a whole different experience than watching Cyril Richard. And, and even though that's a live taping too, but it, it's, it's created quite a buzz for kids. And it's a very exciting process. Anyway, that's just a comment. I have one suggestion. Um, I see 2,000 kids every fall for auditions to come into our freshman class. And because there has been such a decimation of the arts in the middle school, middle schools, um, I have kids coming in and doing two monologues, and they will be doing a scene where they play both George and Emily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they do not know what a monologue is. Mm -hmm. So this is the school where maybe when they decide to do a play, they don't know the rights. They don't know what a monologue is. They don't know anything. Especially the schools from the Bronx. These kids are clueless and starving. Starving for something. So it might be a nifty idea maybe to put a video on, something really easy, uh, and send it to the principals of middle schools and high schools, letting them know about how excited you are that they might want to do plays. Mm. And they might have to put them on themselves, and maybe you could get kids doing it themselves, but they need to follow these rules. And then there was some give and take about how much that would cost. For instance, this year I paid $25,000 to do Greece. That sort of puts your height. The best we could do is break even. We didn't make a penny. And that's five months of work because we start off with a $25,000 deficit. But we did it, and it was great. It was great for morale, and the kids loved it, and hoo-ha. But, um, <laughs> but there might be some give and thank you. There might be some give and take with these, especially the middle schools, and for the schools in areas that are really have no arts. Right. That you sent them a very short videotape, five minutes about, we see you don't have an arts program, maybe you're interested in putting on plays. Here's the rules you have to follow in order to do it. And you have any questions, call us. Any kids would like to call us, call us. And make it very welcoming as opposed to scolding. Um, we might be able to do some real education and support you and support the school. And, and what's, your, what's, your, what's your name? Sandy, Sandy. Mason from LaGuardia High School. So Sandy from LaGuardia, just because I have to repeat all yes. this. Uh, makes a really interesting point about you know um, uh, finding ways to reach students who often come into arts programs are very green, don't know how the system works, using even just a simple short video saying like, hey, here's, here's what you need to do if you want to do a play. You, you also brought up, and I'd love to get your guys' comments on that, but you also brought up a second question, which I just thought on a factual level is, is, is interesting to know, which is um, how are the licensing rates for educational productions at various levels set? Where do those numbers come from? Who, who sets them, et cetera, et cetera? So first, either, either one of those. First of all, Sandy, I just want to say that I think that's a great idea, and we would love to have your input on it. We'll make a video of it. We'll do it. Great. But I, we need some some educators to, to consult with us. And well, that sure would we be me. <laughs> <laughs> I remember there was Abby Van Nostrand. Uh -huh. I mean, you emailed this week already. Uh -huh. uh, Is there anyone who's having relationship trouble, Amy? I mean, while we're solving problems. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. I'm so excited. Like, and I've seen some of your productions at your school. They're great. I will tell you this. I think one of the over 
overarching themes of this week that, is, that we've discussed that has come out of all of this is the greater need for education in all, uh, sorry to me, in all areas. So I think probably what our big takeaway from this, this whole week is that there is a lot more education that needs to take place. And I think that what you've just said is a great place to start. Great. So I great. think that's great. I think I appreciate that. So that's that's great. So it just I, I've always been just curious about you know like what, how do the rates for how how does the you know Laguardia High School wants to do Greece it will cost them twenty five thousand dollars to do so you know sort of like how do those decisions about the different rates at the different levels get get made? Brad, you want to I'm pretending like I didn't hear the question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We have a formula that's pretty similar to what all of the licensing yeah. agencies have, and it's kind of a secret formula, <laughs> and it's always, it's pretty much across the board, and it's all, it's usually very, very similar. We have one or two titles in our catalog that are considered premier titles. Um, and Grace is one of them, and it's very, it has a very high, um, royalty attached to it. Yes. That's non-negotiable, shall we say. Thank you. I wasn't going to say that <laughs> <laughs> But most of um, as for the if it's an amateur play, if it's just a straight play, the royalty price is on the website. So it, there's no no secret there unless uh, there's some tiered situations where if there's a few more seats or if the ticket price is raised that there, it may be adjusted a little bit there. But for the amateur, uh, we take what we consider to be the projected gross of what the amateur right. situation will be, and then we affix a, a percentage of that fee. Right. And I've and we are almost completely all aligned in that in, in with the other agencies. There are a couple of plays that are musicals that are a little bit pricier. For, for the <laughs> most part, was that uh, we have we have. Yes. <laughs> thank you, thank you for thank you for the. the or cost of living, I mean, we're charging a fraction, relatively speaking, of what we used to charge in the, in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Everything else has gone up in price. Ours has creeped up. We, what do we charge for most plays? It's $75 a performance. Back then, we were charging you know, 25 but 25 was a whole lot more money back then. So you know, it's still a pretty, a pretty good deal on most things. There are, as Brad said, some premium titles that just command that, and, and, and a lot of that is driven by, um, by the authors. This is, right. you know, we represent authors, and if, you know, they want us to, to charge more money for it, and they're willing to do with less productions, that's where we are. You, you had a question, sir. Uh, I hope I'm not going off topic here. Uh, Google is doing a mass digitalizing of books. I don't think the hits are exact. Do you all have any concerns with that? You, you're talking about the Google Books project, where they're, where, uh, I, I, do you guys? I, Joe, do you want to address that? Is that a good question? I, no? Or Google Google Books? Yeah, what is I, the question? Uh -huh. I could, actually. I mean, because I manage the Google Book project. I'm the lit manager, so. Amy <laughs> 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 Rose Come on. So, I, I mean, that was a very short <laughs> answer. But, um, you, uh, I mean, Google is opting for, for things that they know are public domain. They actually give publishers the option um, as to how much of the book goes online, as to how much doesn't, as to how much is exposed. Um, Sam Bridge hasn't uploaded any books in a while, I think in like two or three years, but when we were doing it pretty actively, we were only opting for 10% of the book to be available. And they don't show five pages in order. So actually, if you are looking to, plus it's very hard to rip a Google book, but um, you can't ever really get a sense of the play. I actually use it now when, when uh, we have licensing questions about swear words. Sometimes I'll pull up our book samples and search for swear words within a book, but there are, it's actually pretty hard to rip a monologue or rip a... Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah, that is another, th I imagine that's another thing that happens actually, because you mentioned swear words right there. Another thing that I imagine happens in the educational setting is that there's certain like, I don't know that we want our... Right. You know, Please. in our uh, eighth grade production of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. <laughs> Which I will go see. <laughs> and I'll film it. <laughs> 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 
you come over and see it, wouldn't you? I'd say the vast majority of authors are um, uh, are willing to make changes to their play if requested. They just want to be asked. Mm -hmm. There are some authors that say, no, this is my play. If you want to do, if you, if you don't want to do swear words, don't do my play. Do somebody else's play, but don't take my play and, and, and change it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have to add to this too. Ask, A-S-K, ask. That I've been <laughs> working it for 20 years and I just tell people, ask the question. Ask us first. We will work with the agents. We will call up the playwrights ourselves. We will try to get answers for you. Just second in your own smart. There is nothing more difficult for everybody involved than to have to untangle it on the end. Mm -hmm. If a playwright finds out that some changes have been made and the production's already up, all they know is that changes have been made. It may be just some simple language changes, taking some nasty words and taking some swear words. But once they know that it's been changed, it is so difficult to unravel. Please ask us. I asked my staff today. We all looked since January 1st. We have made over almost 300 um, contacts with agents and playwrights asking about things like gender casting changes. Uh, can we take out swear words? Can we trim it a little bit because it needs to come in under two hours? If we know in advance, we can handle it in a much better fashion than than after the fact. Okay, I'm done now. I now you can go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just going to ask you for statistics. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, Isaac, before you were sort of confessing having infringed on copyright. Sure. <laughs> I'm um, sure we all have. <laughs> I used to teach theater um, with middle and high school students, and I would have begged, borrowed, or stolen anything to work with them. Um, and <laughs> Because I thought that I was stealing from Sam French, not from the writer. Um, and if, if that were well, really, and if that were part of the conversation, and it were an opportunity for the kids to connect with the writer in some way, that could be really exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell a story. Before I came to work at Samuel French, my my youngest son was in third grade, and they were doing Wicked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I knew. <laughs> <laughs> So, I don't know this man. What made it really <laughs> terrible was I went into the classroom and the teacher had a bootleg, ver a bootleg video of the Broadway show and she was using that to teach the students. So I was really offended because not only was she she's doing that, but she was, she was teaching my child that it was okay to take other people's work. So, um, I wanted to say something, but you know what? And this is, I think this is, this is true for, not, I, I, tell, I tell on myself because I think it's, it's true for parents and, 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 and people all, all over that maybe want to say something, but you know what my wife said to me? Don't say anything, this is his teacher, just let it be, okay? He doesn't need to stand out in the class, he doesn't need to be the guy that's the bad guy that's shutting down their show. So I didn't say anything, right? I wanted to say something, but I didn't say anything. So I'm saying it now. You're great. Uh, uh, I'm trying to put something. Just it's more criminal than that because you've taken a completely creative, innovative, artistic force in third grade and made them imitate right, exactly. something out of tape. How dare you do that? How do you know what they would have come up with on their own? It's just heartbreaking. Okay, I've said that. And I think somewhat related. Um, I love when they record and broadcast theater. I want more of it because it gives me access to it. Um, and I've had conversations with people asking, why doesn't this happen more? And some people bring up that choreographers and directors don't necessarily want the recording available because then other people will do that choreography or take those directing ideas into their own productions. And that's even less tangible than the words or the music. So where is right. the so, uh, well, uh, uh, And what's your answer? Joe. Joe. Okay, yeah. so Joe is raising the question essentially of, of directorial and choreographic plagiarism. If there's a record of a, of a production, 
and, and this is a, actually still, I think, both legally and in reality a pretty controversial issue. If there's a record of a production with blocking that you can write down and imitate, and then you take that blocking, you know, what is that, how does that work, and is that part of the resistance to moving into the digital age and lawful distribution? Well, I, I don't think there's a lot of resistance to lawful capture and distribution. Um, you know, there are some uh, of, you know, there, there are certainly some of the school of thought it's a live experience, it should only be live, it shouldn't be captured, you know, I want people to come to the theater. But, you know, for the most part, I don't think there's, I think people just want to be, you know, paid or acknowledged. I do think, much like the Wicked story, I, I, and this is at a professional level, where we actually learn that an unlawfully captured production, you don't even have to write down the blocking. They sit in the rehearsal hall with their laptop and say, okay, now what you do on this, okay, on that line you cross over there and you come down here on that. I mean, there are theater companies where that is okay to do. And for directors and choreographers, that's not okay to do. Now, if you want to do it, ask. I was saying earlier, you know, it's sure, send me 50 bucks, but really, could you put a sign in the lobby now that says, inspired by the original production, directed by so and so? You know, don't misrepresent that that's your work, because it's not your work. It's my work as a director or choreographer. Um, certainly, licensing would be great, income would be great, where it's appropriate, blah, 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 but it really is, you cannot misrepresent that you directed and choreographed that show when you didn't. We're working on a few um, uh, plays and musicals where we are creating a director's guide mm -hmm. that can be licensed so that the director um, can be compensated for it. Yeah. Oh, so it's right. like a show line. Right. Like a, yeah. like but for example, 39 Steps. People constantly are recreating the Broadway uh, direction of it because it's, it's amazing direction. It makes the show work. So we're working with uh, the, uh, the original director to create a, a Bible for that. Mm -hmm. Can I ask Laura a question? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> well, I have a question, because this, this is an area that I don't know as well. So, if a theater wants to uh, reproduce one of your members' works, their direction, do they contact you? Well, this is... What, what happens? This is where I think we have to take responsibility, just like we have to take some responsibility for understanding what's possible in the digital age, we have to, and in education. We have to find ways for that to be easier, because it's not clear. It's not clear what the path is. We need our own video to complement your video to middle <laughs> schools that says, and, that say, and if you don't want to actually direct Twelfth Night, <laughs> but would like a cutting and a cast breakdown and a director's, you know, whatever, you know, you can get that, again, for, you know, uh, for whatever that might be. It's not easy to do. Mm -hmm. You can, we do have instances where we have been contacted. We always help facilitate the relationship. Um, we, you know, we also have, things that we've caught, that we've called and said, oh, wow, well, that would be so-and-so's production, um, and gotten either compensation or, or mm -hmm. credit. But it's not easy to do. It's, it's also an opportunity for the director or the choreographer to say, I'll come do it. Pay me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come do it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, it's making it possible that we have to do that. And I think as people get inspired because they see more things online and they want it to look like that, mm -hmm. and I'm in Omaha, and I want to do it just like they did it on Broadway. We have to make that possible for them to do. We always encourage original work first. I mean, that's, but in the case of wanting to replicate, we should make it possible. Uh, yes. Hey, uh, my name is Ira. Uh, I am really excited about this whole conversation because I'm, uh, I'm working on a play about Napster right now called uh, Dark Side Where's Hacker, or two boys called Sean. Um, it's gonna be cool. Words, uh, <laughs> I don't hear it all. And uh, I, I want to say, first off, uh, Jeremy knows what he's doing. that guy is smart. That guy knows what he's talking about. Um, I like surveys and inter and like information gathering through like crowdsourcing because I'm I'm from the digital age. I have a series of references that I'm going to ask you about. And if you are aware of them, if you could raise your, let's say, left hand. Am I raising my left hand? Left hand. Left hand? Is that good? 
Cool. All right. Uh, if you've heard of this, raise your hand. Mashup. What is a mashup? It's a, it's like a sampling of a lot of different things, kind of mashed up together. My son talks about mashup. Okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. Is that close? You're, you're close. Oh, you're very close. You're very close. <laughs> uh, anybody who watches yeah. Glee knows what it is. Yeah. 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 Has anyone? This is just a medley, right? Yeah. 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 Adam, good point. Has anyone uh, know what a remix is? What is a remix? The original thing redone in a different format, taking a, a song and turning it into a, a dance mix or something. Can you give an example of a good remix? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, is there going to be a test? Is there a test? Yeah, uh, is, that, is that one song I like? The guy on the piano? Um, John Legend. John Legend, exactly. The guy on the piano, what's the name of the song? Uh, All of it. Yeah. 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 There's another version of this. Lots of those, right? Can I, can, I, can I just ask, because we're, um, we only have a few minutes left, how many questions? <laughs> <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, no, no, six. One more. One more. One more. One more. Um, has anyone ever heard of Sean Parker? Yes. yes. Is that your name? No. Who's going to be able to answer it? He's the guy, the Napster. Yeah. You know what else he does? He He's played he by Justin Timberlake. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah. Just, I didn't know. All right. So moving on. Um, uh, other questions? Yes. Uh, I just have a question about assuming that we may be moving into a world where theater is uh, digitally available, uh, a production may be digitally available, and where that can possibly be standard rather than exceptional, like the Sound of Music production that's televised, or Into the Woods from decades ago. <clears throat> How will that uh, factor into the contracts that a writer signs, the contracts that an actor signs, if, and anybody else involved in the show, knowing that it may be available on Netflix or available for some sort of streaming widely, rather than that being maybe, maybe, maybe this happens, um, when it starts to become like, probably this will happen. <coughs> yes. Right, so that, that's, that's an interesting right, hypothetical. As we move more in digital distribution, what happens to the, the contracts? Uh, I think I will punt this to our lawyer on the panel <laughs> first for, for your, yeah, for your... Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to uh, punt it to, to Laura since she's the union person because your union's going to this day. Well, we're already starting to embed in our collective bargaining agreements, which then become the agreements for directors, things like collaboration language, meaning that the director, the stage director has the right to collaborate with the capture director on the capture, the shot list, the blah, blah. So we're beginning to put things like that to make sure our billing's in line. To So we're already beginning to move towards um, believing that this is going to happen. The economic terms, um, we're in the process of trying to figure out whether it's what the front end, what the back end, what goes into the CBA, what's left to the artist that happens to have the great agent versus the other one that, you know, they've just landed their first Cats production and so they're screwed because they didn't have the agent. So we're trying to figure out economic models right now, but we're moving to make sure the creative terms are protected um, as we begin to try to understand the economics. I think in terms of, you brought the actors, for example, this is all, as Laura's saying, it's gonna become standard, I believe. And right now, any new musical that gets produced, every actor that gets hired, or 99% of the time, they're gonna be given, along with their regular contract, a, a cast album writer to sign. And that spells out the terms for what happens, what they get paid, front end, back end, when a cast album is recorded. And I think ultimately we're going to wind up with the same thing for capturing the, the, the video. Uh, Just also in, the, in terms of though, um, if it's like a, I know that the first class rights option might be a reproduction as a film or a Broadway production of a, a, like a revival. Um, if that becomes so standard it's such that we might want to start posting it on um, some, some medium online, what would the contract 
look like for new writers that are signing contracts and how might that play into uh, existing contracts that existed before we even knew that the digital age was coming or that even TV was coming? Oh, that's interesting. So you're talking about like, what do we do with stuff that's still under copyright that was written before the internet? You know, what what happens to those those agreements? I mean, I, you know, one of the the interesting cases not in theater was with the re-release of the the sitcom um, WKRP when they put out a box set of it. DVDs didn't exist when the rights agreements for all the music in the show were signed, and they decided that it was out of their budget to re-license the music, and so they hired four like three studio musicians to re-record generic classic rock sounding tracks that Whoa. play through the whole sitcom. Yeah, if you look, if you get a DVD of WKRP in Cincinnati, it's totally different. <laughs> but, but that's an interesting example. These problems do come up because the technology changes even though the, you know, different agreements are negotiated at different times. In support, in, speaking as from, from the writer's perspective, my understand, I'm not, from the writers. But anyhow, my understanding of the writer's perspective on some of this, it may be the highest bar because in talking with our colleagues at the Dramatist Guild, it's the exploitation of film motion picture rights that it's the, those other uses of the new play. The new play is going to be the hardest thing to wrestle with here because that's embedded in the writer's agreement there is their future in like a really material so how that barrier is going to be um, uh, crossed or penetrated is, I think, it's going to be hard. Well, in most instances, licensing agencies like this only hold the live stage licensing rights. So the mechanical, the audio, the video rights, anything like that is still controlled by the writer, by um, him or herself through their agent, right? So that would probably, I don't think it would really alter our licenses all that much. No, would, but you know, it, those would, things would, would get addressed like in, in, if there was a dramatist guild agreement and an approved production contract is, is a rider that goes with it, um, it's called Article 22, and everything else that's not in the APC in the approved production contract is put into that. And, and an artist can agree to it or not agree to it. Mm -hmm. Usually the, the dramatist guild weighs in and says, we'll, we'll approve this for our members or, or not. But it's, it's a negotiation, it's just business. So, you know, a, a producer that thinks they want to make a, a video of it or a recording of it will attempt to get those rights. Otherwise, most contracts have a reservation of rights that anything other than what's being um, uh, negotiated for here is reserved to the author. Great. I think we have time for a couple more questions. So, you and then uh, Adam. Hi. Um, first, I just want to say thank you so much for all the service that you do for us, for the community in all the different ways, and really appreciate it. I basically just want to ask, I think, I think the overall theme tonight and mainly this week is, is how important education is and educating each other, educating students, future artists. What can we, uh, people who are currently writing, creating intellectual property, aside from education, which is the most important thing, I don't even know if you can answer this, but what can we do to be to continue to be a part of that conversation, either with publishers, with legislators, with uh, you know, how can how can we continue to advocate and and influence that conversation? If you have any suggestions. So, so the question is about you know what can the individual artist do if this is an issue that they care about? What can the individual artist do or be doing? Uh, uh, ongoing to, you know, uh, around the issue of piracy well, I'm in the gonna, digital I'm going to ask uh, Stephen to answer that because it's really, <laughs> about, it's really about artists, I believe, educating themselves as to what, you know, their rights are. Well, good, you I take think, it. I think you start with yourself, right? And you have that integrity as far as the intellectual property that you create and perhaps that you are accessing. Uh, and then the next thing that you do is you pass that on to everybody you're working on that show with. And then the next show. And little by little, it spreads in a grassroots way through the theater community. And then we all have a lot more respect for the work that, we're, that each of us is creating. <laughs> sure. Hi, um, I'm really career, really like you, and I end up producing a lot of my own stuff or producing for friends. And 
then kind of funnily find myself on the other side of the table raising money to pay people or not pay people or asking people to do things for free, which I think we need to stop doing and we need to stop agreeing to, even when we're first starting out. Cool. Cool. Uh, Adam, you want to take us home? You got a uh, sure. Uh, just to go way back to Brian's question about theater being inherently analog, I think there's a fair amount of evidence that film productions and film adaptations of shows actually drive people back into the theater. Mm -hmm. I remember when the Chicago movie came out and the play was still running on Broadway and people thought it was going to close, and that was 10 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and I noticed a yeah, lot of um, a lot of theaters around the country are doing Into the Woods this spring, and I have to believe it's because they are assuming that they're going to see that sell really well because of the movie coming out of Christmas. I think the it's... Chicago movie won a bunch of Oscars. Sure. Which is a bit of a plot. The Phantom movie did not. And <laughs> and Tales for Phantom rose when that movie came out. And I think, and this is what NC Live does too, is that they're trying, they're actually not trying to recreate the play, they're trying to create a really good filmed experience of that play and get people to then go see something live. Just so, so you know, I believe, and I could be wrong, but I believe the conventional wisdom is not that, at least from my perspective, is that usually if a movie's coming out, the play has about eight weeks after that movie is, it hits the theaters. It has eight weeks left before it closes. Um, because why spend, why spend, I mean, even if it's an awkward, I remember Steel Magnolias is the, is the classic sure. example. Because but Mamma Mia is still running, Rock of Ages is still running years after this movie. Those bad movies sorry, <laughs> <laughs> in my opinion. Right. Uh, but so just so you're clear, Adam you know, thinks the movie <laughs> Rock, rock of Ages, yeah, I'll stand by that. <laughs> but if you can go see a movie with big name movie stars in it for ten dollars versus spending, you know, eighty to one hundred and fifty dollars to see a Broadway right. star that maybe isn't as familiar to you. Maybe the movie is not the best example, but I, I know that that's part of NT Live's goal, and also because it's a national theater and they're they have plays going on all the time, it may not be that the film was going to be people of that play, but it may read people to another one, or it may read people who were never ever going to go to the theater in the first place. And so they're trying to make a really great movie theater experience for those people so they can see that and experience the work that way. And other people are going to go see it. But what I also, I'm sorry, I just don't have to what I also think happens from a stock and amateur standpoint is people see the movie, they know there's a play, and they say, I want to play that. Right, you how many of us did we go to high school before, because we so. grew up on that on PBS? I, we did. We probably did. <laughs> I think it was, it's a conventional wisdom because I think it used to be true. Right. And I think that the world has changed. And I think if you even go back, forget about film, right? Um, with Les, the, the world of Les Mis and Phantom on Broadway in the late 80s and early 90s, mm -hmm. and with multiple productions of those companies touring the country, and what was happening? People were seeing those productions in their hometown and coming to New York, and what were they going to go see? Les Mis or Phantom that they already saw in their hometown. I think we're, we're consuming things in a different way now. We're consuming things, we want to see things multiple times. Um, and that's very different than the old days where, oh, Wizard of Oz or Sound of Music is going to be on once a year on CBS or whatever, and I'm going to sit down and watch it that one day because that's all I can get. And so we were sort of used to that world of we get it once and then maybe at some point in the future. But I think to Ryan's point, the, the live experience is different and people know that. Yeah. And so if they get interested in, in the, I hate to say property, but in the property because of something out there, they might then, it's like seeing your favorite band live. Yeah. Right, so yeah. well, it's, 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 it, ha it happened, it happened, year, it happened with iTunes. Yeah. I mean, there's this idea of fidelity recording and iTunes squeezed the book rates down to manageable right. downloadable sizes. So you did lose a sense of the original, you're listening to Beatles at like in little tiny right. earbuds, there is a problem there. And I actually like videos uh, of productions even if they're done relatively poorly. So that, in some regard, degradation of quality is the main issue. Right. right. Um, so I, I hear the furtive noises of a wine and cheese party <laughs> building. So I just want to open it up to last words that anyone might have that they want to they want to throw in. Well, I would be remiss if I did not point out that moments before we walked up here, my new BFF, Laura, <laughs> told me that today is her 25th wedding anniversary. <laughs>
everyone. So thank you all so much for coming. Sit with me tight for a minute because I have to give some major thank yous out. First, to Bruce Lazarus and to Nate Collins. They are our executive director and our president. And if it weren't for their passion about these subjects, we wouldn't all be here today. So just a huge thank you to you guys. take a mighty village. So I just want to give a quick shout out to Brad, to Abby, to Ryan, to Chris, to Amy. Um, without them and their tireless efforts of getting panelists and coming up with ideas, uh, we wouldn't all be here. And then one... Well, so to be fair, yeah. we wouldn't be here at all without Courtney. <laughs> share of the word organized this week and talking to panelists. So uh, another round of applause for Gordon. Okay. Okay. He's the best boss ever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I also want to give a shout out to all of our locations, many of whom representatives are here. New Dramatist, Lark Dramatist Guild, and Case McLean back there from Samuel French and Corinne and Elizabeth. They made it more than being hosts, they were actively involved. And then one final thank you to HowlRound, we're talking like you're there, and you are. Um, they helped us, they have awesome essays up on their site, many written by people in this room, so go check it out. And now we invite you to not only come and enjoy some refreshments over there, but check out our script table. Please take one script, one tote bag. We want theater to spread, make theater happen. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs>